Hello and welcome to the RPG Blender, where we give lesser played games and forgotten settings the roll the dice they deserve. I'm your host, Game Master George, and today we continue our look into the playtest release of an upcoming indie RPG, Rupture. Previously, we took a look at the overall lore of the world of Rupture, as well as a guide on how to create your characters and an introduction to the basic rules of the game. So today we'll be covering the magic system of Rupture. We'll go through spellcasting, mana channeling, and the schools of magic. Then if you'd like, you can check out our actual play to witness the magic. Links in the cards. And then be sure to subscribe for future parts of this tutorial, where we'll talk more about some tips for you, a game master. One thing to note, this is a playtest release. So some things may have changed by the time of final production. Be sure you followed for a future update video once the final production release occurs. But now before we dive in, just a quick word from our sponsor, Rupture. Rupture is an upcoming tabletop RPG with an emphasis on character creation and story. Featuring an easy to use character background generation system, Rupture strives to give role playing newbies a ready made backstory and veterans some interesting story seeds to flesh out. You'll find enough crunch in the mechanics to satisfy a gamer, while someone who is more narrative focused will find the story first gameplay appealing. If this sounds interesting, and you're currently watching part 4 of a tutorial series on this game, so I imagine it must, the Kickstarter will be launching on September 6th, so join their mailing list at www.rupturerpg.com to be notified when that goes live. Now without further promotion, let's dive into this brand new RPG in part 4 of Let's Run Beta, Rupture, Mechanics of Magic. In the world of Rupture, magic is within everything. Every character has access to a font of magic within themselves. For a spellcaster, the use of mana is obvious. But what about for someone who chooses to thwack things with a sword? For them, they have mana channeling. This is the act of pushing the inherent mana they possess into something else. Generally, this will serve the purpose of activating another object's inherent effects. The end result of the effect being narrator fiat. Yes, this is the a wizard did it effect. When a player pushes their magic into a wooden pole, it might change into a different material, extend out to 10 feet, or begin to regrow into the tree it was carved from. This is a chance for the narrator to add flavor to their world, and a reason for the players to examine and interact with their surroundings. I would highly advise that the answer is never nothing happens. This is a world where magic permeates everything, so there should always be some effect. It doesn't need to be anything impactful, it could just change the color of an item depending on the eye color of the person using it, but it should always do something. As for the actual mechanics, there isn't that much to worry about. The player can channel their magic points in increments of two into an item. They can channel as much or as little as they choose to. From there, it's up to the narrator to determine the effect and the total number of points that they'll need to push in in order for it to happen. If you're a narrator looking for ideas for those effects, stick around for a future video on some narrator tips I'm putting together based on my experience running this game. But now, let's talk the meat. Actual spell casting. As you might guess, this is the act of casting spells. Any character has the potential of picking up a school of magic. With the extreme availability of magic in this world, even a barbarian could pick up some magical ability. In fact, a hybrid giant kitsune barbarian with earth magic could be a terrifying combatant. Prepare yourself, my players. However, this availability does not mean that it is easy to use. To be a spellcaster, you will need to understand spells, tokens, and glyphs. The first step to spellcasting is researching a spell. This consists of in-character study, be it traditional book learning, or studying places of power or things tied to the school of magic. When studying through traditional methods, use the research skill, while communing with places or things should use glyphs. When using research, the difficulty is lower, but it is of course more restrictive, requiring appropriate books or a teacher. To find these, the players can attempt a luck check when they enter a new location to see if a suitable source of knowledge exists in this area. Glyphs are generally easier to find a place to study, depending on the school of course. What's a place of power for telepathy? But the target numbers will generally be higher as this is self-guided experimental study. Passing either of these checks will allow the players to learn the basics of a new spell, though that does not yet give them the ability to cast it. Next up, tokens. Tokens are basically a combination of a magical focus and a spellbook. This is an item, any kind of item as long as it has some 
personal connection to the character, which the spellcaster uses as a conduit for their spellcasting. They will inscribe glyphs onto this item, which represent the spells that they can cast using this token. Each token will have a number of glyphs that it can support based on the results of its token creation roll. To create the token, players will roll their token creation skill. Getting a roll of 12 will create a token with three glyph slots, with higher rolls giving more slots up to 15 with a roll of 25. However, should the player critically fail the roll, the item that they're using, which again, should be one with a personal connection, breaks. Once the player has their token, they'll need to go through the process of inscribing glyphs onto it. Each glyph is the representation of a spell effect, allowing that spell to be cast through that token. To etch the glyph, the players must first know the spell, and then make a glyphs roll, with a difficulty determined by the order of the spell. First order spells need only a 12, while a seventh order would need a 30. In order to inscribe a spell of a specific order, you must have at least that many ranks in the glyphs skill. So to inscribe a spell of the first order, you would need at least one rank in glyphs, whereas you would need at least seven for a seventh order. So now that we have our spell, token, and glyph, we can attempt to cast the spell. Good news is, the hard part is over. Casting a spell requires spending a number of magic points equal to the order of the spell times 10. Then, making a skill check of the spell's school. This skill check has a difficulty determined by the order of the spell. So as an example, if we have an intelligence of six and a nature magic of three, and we try to cast the second order spell decay, we would need to spend 20 magic points, then make a difficulty 15 roll. With the bonus of nine from our attribute and skill, we would need to roll a six to succeed on this check. If we succeed, the spell is cast as desired. Depending on the spell, there may be a secondary roll needed, for example, with many attack spells, but in general, Succeeding in this spell means that the spell is at least cast. Now, if we fail to hit the target number, nothing special much happens aside from wasting the magic points. However, if we critically fail, a wisp is created. A wisp is the living embodiment of the spell that gave it life. It will constantly and randomly cast that spell until it is slain. Oh, and the glyph disappears from the token on that critical failure, so it cannot be cast again until the glyph is remade. Now, let's say that you've been targeted by a successful spell. Do you just Play back and take it? Of course not. You get a roll to resist the effect. For a spell which directly targets you, you can make a willpower resist magic roll against the casting roll of the spellcaster. If you beat their roll, you are unaffected by their spell. If, however, it's a spell with an effect on something else, such as using flying rock to launch a rock at your head, this would require a block or dodge, like normal when blocking or dodging an attack. Many spells will define this within their rules. However, it is up to the DM to adjudicate when other spells might require this. Now, the last topic to talk about is the magical schools. There are 14 schools of magic, which can be divided into three groups based on their legality within the Turalian Empire. First up are the schools which are legal to learn because they are considered safe to use, with their spells being found in even minor cities. These are the schools of illusion, life, order, thaumaturgy, and nature. After that are the restricted schools. These have the potential for danger, or are viewed with disdain by those who determine the legality. This includes the elemental schools of air, earth, fire, and water. The fifth restricted school is a bit different, however. That is divine. This school is considered restricted due to the limitations of deities. If you follow one of the gods of the divine pantheon, then your use of divine magic is considered legal. However, if you follow a darker god, then your divine magic is completely banned. So be careful who sees you work your magic. The final category are the illegal schools. They are considered extremely dangerous and will be very hard to find a source of study. Anyone caught using one of these in any of the major empires will be swiftly arrested. These schools are chaos, death, 
telepathy and time. The reasons for each of these being legal are probably obvious. After creation, a character can attempt to learn a new spellcasting school, similar to how they would learn a new spell. They can learn from a teacher, do research, or attempt to commune with a place or object which embodies the principles of that school. Each method requires a skill check in order to gain the ability to put future skill ranks into that school. The target number of this skill is lowest with instruction, higher with book study, and highest when communing. The first two will use a research role, whereas communing will use glyphs. So, now that we have an idea of how magic works in this system, let's see how we can twist it to fit our setting customizations. For the source of magic, we need to represent the corruptive touch of the outsider. First up, we will change the wisp mechanic. Instead of creating an independent bit of sentient magical energy, a critical failure will give the outsider a window into this world. Mechanically, this will create a wisp-like creature. However, rather than the effect being random and guided by its own form of sentience, it is now guided by the will of the outsider. This has now unleashed a bit of chaotic energy into the world, and if the players do not destroy it before it escapes, it will work to further the outsider's goal. So track how many of them are created during your game by each of your players, and darken the world accordingly. Secondly, we need to introduce the risk of corruption through the use of magic. Whenever a player critically fails a role related to the use of mana, they will endanger their sanity. They must immediately make a flat d12 roll against the target number of their sanity, plus the number of wisps they have created and not destroyed. If they beat that target number, they manage to keep their calm. If they should fail to meet it, however, they immediately lose sanity points equal to half the amount they failed the check by, minimum two. However, they then increase their mana base by one. This represents represents their slipping mind delving deeper into the magic-granting powers of the outsider, while fraying the edges of their mind. For the Magic Punk setting, we actually want to leave many of the rules as is. The idea behind this setting is to bring traditional spellcasting into a more futuristic setting. So, most of it works well. However, I would suggest having creatures that are heavily modified by cybernetics be harder to affect with magical abilities. This would be an involuntary resistance, affecting both harmful effects and helpful. The exact numbers here would depend on how you build out your augmentation system, which is very much outside of the scope of this little bit of theory crafting, but the idea would be that having cybernetics would act as a positive modifier to their resist magic role. It would also force you to make that role, whether you were targeted by a harmful effect or a friendly one. So anytime you're targeted by a spell, be it friend or foe, you will make your resist magic roll and add your cybernetic bonus. Finally, for My Hero Magicka, we want to focus more on mana channeling than spell casting. Spell casting in this setting should be less common or outright not exist if you're not looking for a Doctor Strange type hero. Instead, have your players select a number of spells equal to their mana base, which will act as their hero powers. They can activate them by attuning magic points to that power, equal to the number they would have needed to use to cast it. So the order times 10. While attuned, they can use that power natively. Though they will still need to make a roll in order to affect an unwilling person with it, it'll be a normal attack roll rather than a spellcasting roll. Now, yes, this will lead to some overpowered characters. For example, if they take a healing spell, they would be able to infinitely heal their friendly party members outside of combat. But really, that lack of balance fits with the idea of superheroes. Superman is not a balanced character. Yes, he can be countered, but when taken by the numbers one-on-one, -on -one, he is usually going to come out on top. So let your players enjoy the feeling of being OP heroes. Then bring in your own OP villains. And that about wraps up this look into the magic mechanics of this game. Thanks for sticking around. I hope this has helped you to understand the workings of magic within this system. There are of course smaller details with the magic in the world, but the rules covered here are what you need to dive into the magic system when you start your play. My players personally have greatly enjoyed this magic system. The open-ended effects of many of the spells lead to creative uses rather than the point-and-shoot mentality of Dungeons & Dragons spells. Stay tuned as next 
next time we'll be covering a guide for narrators. So if you enjoyed this, please like, comment, subscribe, and maybe check out our play of the game here, or join the Rupture mailing list at www.rupturerpg.com. As always, a big thank you to our sponsor Rupture, and our Patreon subscribers who keep this channel running. Anyway, thank you again for watching, and remember, there's gaming outside the Forgotten Realms. Thank you.